Hello, and welcome to Optimizing Gut Health to Support Detoxification. My name is Adair Anderson. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian with an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in clinical nutrition. I'm presenting this webinar on behalf of Vibrant Wellness, where I work as a clinical lab educator. This presentation will explore the overlap between Vibrant's gut zoomer and total tox burning tests, including mycotoxins, environmental toxins, and heavy metals. It's natural to focus on mobilizing toxins when you get your total tox burden results back, but if those toxins can't get out of the body, you may be doing more harm than good. Today, we'll explore the phases of detoxification, including which phase to upregulate first. I'll provide intervention considerations to support detoxification, how to identify toxicity from the gut tumor test, and actionable take-home tools to help you eliminate toxins and improve GI health. First up, overview of detoxification. So we are exposed to toxins by the things we put into our body, the things we put on our body or allow to touch our skin, and by also by the things we breathe into our body. As you may know, most toxins are fat soluble. So to facilitate elimination, the body converts fat soluble toxins into more water soluble or polar compounds. To do this, the body first activates the toxin, actually making it more toxic. This is phase one detoxification. Notice that phase one creates activated intermediates and those activated intermediates produce reactive oxygen species or ROS that can damage the liver. This is why detoxification requires ample antioxidant support, including vitamins A, C, and E, CoQ10, zinc, selenium, and bioflavonoids. In phase two, the body attaches a big water-soluble compound like glucuronic acid to toxins, making them more water-soluble. And finally, in phase three, the water-soluble compounds are eliminated from the body, excreted via stool, urine, or sweat. So here's the most important question. If you have a client who needs to detox, where do you start? So thinking about the flow of toxins into and out of the body, which part of this pathway has the biggest impact on the client? The best place to start is actually by reducing exposure. Helping your clients reduce their exposure to toxins has the biggest impact on detoxification. It's because if you don't stop putting water in the tub, there's no way the drain can catch up, especially if that drain is clogged or slow. Okay, so once we've turned the water, turned off the water coming into the tub, what's the second step in supporting detoxification? Well, the next step in helping your clients rid their body of toxins is to increase excretion and elimination. I'm talking actually about phase three detoxification here, when the toxins leave the body via that stool, sweat, urine, or breathing. And once you've slowed the flow of toxins coming into the body and sped up the excretion toxins out of the body, what's the third step in detoxification? The third step is to upregulate phase two, specifically to make fat soluble toxins more soluble in water. When explaining phase two to clients, I usually say that toxins are like little monsters running around in your body causing trouble. No one wants to handle monsters because, well, they have sharp teeth and sharp claws. However, once you put that monster in a box, i.e. conjugate it with a water-soluble compound, all the organs can actually help transport those monsters out of the body. Notice the arrows on this slide. They're bi it's bicolored, with yellow on the left representing a fat-soluble compound and blue on the right representing a water-soluble compound. Making toxins more water-soluble, i.e. putting that monster in a box, all of a sudden the body can better handle and transport those toxins out of the body from the liver to the kidneys or the gut so they can be eliminated via urine or stool. Okay, so now that we've slowed the flow of toxins coming into the body, increased excretion of toxins out of the body and can efficiently put those monster toxins into a box, what's the final step to focus on and upregulate when supporting detoxification? You guessed it, the final step is supporting phase one. Phase one activates those fat soluble toxins, so polar water soluble compounds can be attached to it in phase two. Remember, activating toxins actually makes them more toxic in most cases. 
And then those activated intermediates do create those reactive oxygen species. And for this reason, the liver needs ample antioxidant support during phase one to protect itself. Thinking critically here, what happens if you support phase one before phase two? Well, if you upregulate phase one, but fail to upregulate phase two, you quickly run out of boxes to put those monsters in, which results in an abundance of these activated irritable monsters creating reactive oxygen species running around in your liver using up all your antioxidants. Not good. Another way to think about this is a traffic jam. You know, everything slows before that bottleneck and phase two becomes the rate limiting step. So if you upregulate phase one, but fail to upregulate phase two, you end up with a buildup of these toxic intermediates. Here's a real life application here. Huh. This buildup of toxic intermediates is what happens when you take acetaminophen, commonly known as Tylenol, and then later drink alcohol. The body actually thinks that alcohol is more dangerous than Tylenol, so it stops processing the acetaminophen in favor of getting rid of the alcohol, leaving behind even more of these toxic intermediates. In fact, acetaminophen overdose has surpassed viral hepatitis as the leading cause of acute liver failure. Note that taking N-acetylcysteine or NAC prior to drinking alcohol or taking Tylenol can actually help protect the liver from the negative impact of these substances. To summarize what we discussed so far, the best way to support liver detoxification is to first reduce exposure, then increase excretion, and to work on the liver last, supporting phase two before upregulating phase one. Now that we've done a deep overview of detoxification, let's switch gears and talk about how you can use the gut zoomer to identify and thus reduce toxic load and to support detoxification. First step, which gut zoomer markers provide inside, insight on toxin exposure? Of the seven markers on the inflammation panel, two are associated with toxic burden. First is MMP9. MMP9 is repair enzyme that gets upregulated when there is GI damage. It's also a marker for chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, due to biotoxin or mold exposure. Therefore, MMP9, when it's elevated, consider running mycotoxins tests on your patient to investigate if they have mold exposure there. The next one is eosinophil protein X. Elevation in eosinophil protein X suggests food allergy, food sensitivity, IBD, and also parasites. So there is evidence that certain parasites can accumulate heavy metals at concentrations that are orders of magnitude higher than those in the host tissue or the surrounding environment. A lot of this research is done in fish. Um, in fact, they use fish as biological indicators of heavy metal pollution in an aquatic environment. Looking at the fourth citation on this page, they're suggesting that intestinal parasites act as a biofilter for heavy metals, thus reducing heavy metals pollution. So anytime you see parasites on your patient's test or fecal, um, or when fecal eosinophil protein X is elevated, consider running a heavy metals test to investigate more. Okay, so now that we've identified gut tumor markers that provide insight on exogenous toxins or toxins outside of the body, let's talk about gut tumor markers that provide insight on endogenous toxins or toxins located inside the body. I specifically want to talk about lipopolysaccharide or LPS for short. LPS is an important component of gram-negative bacteria. It's on their outer membrane. And as gram-negative bacteria grow, they're constantly shedding this LPS. Therefore, LPS is naturally present in the gut. Unfortunately, when the gut is leaky, LPS can enter the bloodstream causing endotoxemia. In fact, when you do a literature search, LPS and endotoxemia are intertwined. They can be used um, for each other. This is worsened by several conditions. One is opportunistic overgrowth, since when you have more bacteria, they're creating more LPS load in the gut. And then also, anytime you are treating with antimicrobials or antibiotics, it actually increases LPS present because gram-negative bacteria do release more LPS when they die. Looking at the phyla panel on the gut tumor, proteobacteria is a phyla that houses these LPS-producing gram-negative bacteria. Based on the research I've read, I understand that proteobacteria should be less than 10% and ideally less than 5%, just because it has so much of this LPS. 
Anytime proteobacteria is elevated on gut tumor results, I suspect overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria and abundance of this LPS endotoxin. This suspicion can be confirmed by assessing other gram-negative bacterial markers, such as Escherichia coli and Enterobacteriaceae. A class of bacteria that includes Klebsiella, Morganella, Salmonella, Shigella, Citrobacter, along with that E. coli. Really, anything with a negative sign after it is gram-negative on the gut tumor results. Enterobacteriaceae is found on nine out of those 11 commensal panels, including intestinal permeability, liver health, and E. coli is found in four out of the 11 panels, including SIBO, cardiovascular health, metabolic health, and liver health. Um, they are both found on the liver health panel, so I sometimes just scroll there to see. When the gut is leaky, LPS will enter the hepatic portal vein and go directly to the liver, where, of course, it increases the toxic, the toxic burden on the liver. In other words, the liver does considerable work to remove this endotoxin from the bloodstream and the body. Since LPS becomes problematic when the gut is leaky, another gut tumor marker to check is fecal zonulin. Elevation in fecal zonulin is indicative of intestinal hyperpermeability, commonly referred to as leaky gut. It is well documented in the literature that consuming gluten can increase fecal zonulin. However, if fecal antigliadin is within normal limits, suspect that dysbiosis or toxins may be actually breaking down that intestinal barrier and not the gluten. According to Vibrant's Environmental Toxins Guide, environmental toxins can change the ecosystem of the microbiome. And certain environmental toxins have been shown to correlate with intestinal permeability. Additionally, certain environmental toxins have been shown to increase dysbiotic biotic microbes in the gut. In other words, when you have toxic burden, it can change what's going on in your gut microbiome for the worse. So once you've used the gut zoomer to identify toxins getting into the body, you can use the environmental toxins, heavy metals, and mycotoxins guides to help your clients decrease their exposure. If the gut zoomer markers indicate leaky gut, considering protocols to heal the gut and promote barrier integrity would be the next step. And if the gut zoomer results indicate overgrowth of that gram-negative bacteria, well, stay tuned because I will provide step-by-step -step details on how to prevent opportunistic overgrowth at the end of this presentation. All right, next, let's talk about how you can use the gut zoomer to support detoxification, starting with increasing toxin excretion. The main way we eliminate toxins is via the stool. So the first place to start is ensuring regular bowel movements. Ideally, it's three per day. Methanobrevibacter smithii found on the SIBO panel is associated with constipation-dominant SIBO because methanogens produce methane gas, and methane gas is known to slow motility. Therefore, when a patient's levels of M. smithii are elevated and or the patient tells you they have constipation, that's the first thing to resolve before starting any liver or detox protocols. Page 53 of the Environmental Toxins Guides provides elimination considerations. For example, you can support elimination of toxins via the feces by increasing fiber intake to promote regular bowel movements. The average American only gets 11 grams of fiber per day, which is less than half the recommended amount, which is 25 grams per day for women and 38 grams a day for men. Eating healthy fats can also support detoxification by increasing bile. Bile binds those toxins. At the same time, increasing intakes of, intake of polyphenol-rich foods can also support elimination because polyphenols adsorb bile acids keeping them and the toxins in the gut so they can be eliminated via the stool instead of reabsorbed into the body via the hepatic portal vein. Anyone who spent a day in the sun knows it's difficult to pass dehydrated stool. So staying hydrated and consuming filtered water daily not only prevents constipation, but also supports elimination of toxins via urine. I specify filtered water because actually many toxins are found in brown water or city water. So filtering the water first can help reduce toxin exposure. If your patients can't afford to buy a water filtration system, simply filling up a large pot of water and letting it sit for 24 hours, you know, allowing all the toxins to settle to the bottom and then only using the top two thirds of the water is a no cost way to reduce toxin exposure. Finally, you can support elimination of toxins via the skin by sweating. This can be done via exercising in a hot environment or by sauna bathing. Found this fantastic 2021 review that found that 19 minutes at 174 degrees elicited the most robust protective effect. 
The review also found that sweating increases the excretion of some heavy metals, specifically 3.75 fold for aluminum, 7 fold for cobalt, 17 fold for lead, and 25 fold for cadmium compared to elimination via urine alone. To summarize, you could help your clients increase excretion of toxins by addressing constipation, promoting bile production, adequate hydration, regular bowel movements, along with considering sauna bathing and other activities to increase sweating and prevent the overgrowth of methanogen. If the above approaches do not work, you may also consider nutraceuticals. Here are two products to support bowel motility and regularity. Colon RX by Designs for Health uses two research-backed ingredients to help improve bowel motility and tonicity in people with occasional constipation, it includes magnesium hydroxide and triphala, triphala, however you pronounce that Ayurvedic herb combination. Colon X by Vimogen is designed to support gastrointestinal regularity and complement dietary fiber intake. This includes magnesium citrate as well as cape aloe and that triphala again. Okay, now that we've covered step one and step two, let's move on to three, increasing phase two detoxification, specifically focusing today on glucuronidation. The gut similar markers that have the biggest impact on phase two detoxification are glucuronidase on the other markers panel and beta glucuronidase producing bacteria on the hormones commensal panel. Anytime either of these is elevated, suspect increased toxic burden and problems with liver detoxification. This is because beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme that reverses glucuronidation. If you remember, glucuronidation is one of the phase two pathways. Glucuronic acid is one of the boxes used to get toxins out of the body. And beta-glucuronidase reverses that glucuronidation. Essentially, it takes the toxins out of the boxes and sends them back to the liver. A great example here is estrogen. Estrogen is removed from the body through glucuronidation. Uh, essentially, estradiol combines with glucuronic acid form uh, estradiol glucuronide. Then that estradiol glucuronide is sent to the gut to be eliminated via the stool. However, resident microbes like Rhamnococcus or Clostridium produce beta-glucuronidase, which hydrolyzes um, glucuronide conjugates, i.e. it reverses glucuronidation, increasing the likelihood that that estrogen is reabsorbed into the hepatic portal vein and sent back to the liver. So sometimes people are producing normal amounts of estrogen, but their gut bacteria is preventing that estrogen from leaving their body, resulting in symptoms of estrogen dominance. In this case, it is um, the solution is not to mess with hormones, but actually to just reduce the bacterial overgrowth and support liver detoxification so the estrogen can finally get excreted from the body. As a side note here, these images um, are from page, or this image is from page 44 of the Gut Zoomer Interpretation Guide. Oral supplementation of calcium d glucrate has been shown to inhibit beta glucuronidase. You know, many companies make a calcium d glucurate product. Uh, here is one from page six of Vibrant's Detoxification Support Nutraceutical Guide. And note here that calcium d glucurate is contraindicated for patients with low estrogen levels as it can cause estrogen levels to go too low if the patient's actually not making enough. In addition to reducing overgrowth of beta-glucuronidase producing bacteria, you can also just support glucuronidation by increasing consumptions of foods like cruciferous vegetables and resveratrol foods. This list is from page 55 of the Environmental Toxins Guide, which lists inducers actually for all six um, phase two conjugation pathways, as well as phase one pathway support. And again, if a client is unwilling or unable to consume foods, you may consider some nutraceuticals. Here are two products that support glucuronidation. The first one is the Cooley Cooley Moringa Powder. I learned about this when Dr. Rhonda Patrick was being interviewed by Dr. Andrew Huberman on episode 70 of the Huberman Lab podcast. She says she takes two tablespoons of this every morning to support her phase two detoxification. The other product I've listed is on our detoxification support nutraceutical guide, just Sulfora Clear by Menogenics, which contains a unique combination of broccoli ingredients that supply standardized amounts of support for sulforaphane production. So to summarize, 
you can help your clients upregulate phase two detoxification by supporting the six conjugation pathways, especially glucuronidation, and by preventing overgrowth of those beta glucuronidase producing bacteria. So expanding our focus beyond glucuronidation, all phase two and phase one pathways require many nutrients for optimal performance. The remainder of this presentation will focus on optimizing micronutrient levels. As a reminder, here are all of the nutrients required for robust biotransformation and detoxification of toxins. Certainly, the first step is optimizing nutrient status to ensure your patients getting adequate oral intake from their diet. So, you know, are they eating the foods, right? First place to start, are they eating the foods? If your client is unable to get adequate oral intake, here are a couple of foundational supplements to um, support elimination of environmental and dietary toxins in the liver. The first is Mediclear by Thorn, which is a rice and pea-based protein um, supplement that is a complete multivitamin and mineral with additional GI and liver support nutrients. The other one here is Ultra Clear Renew by Metagenics, which is a, actually a medical food, uh, meaning it's approved by the FDA to treat a specific condition. Um, this one was formulated to deliver advanced specialized nutrition support. It actually supports phase one, phase two, as well as phase three. It has some fiber in there too. So certainly first place to start, make sure our clients are eating adequate nutrients to support phase one, phase two detoxification, including adequate protein. However, sometimes a patient is eating a robust diet, but they're still experiencing malnutrition. When this is the case, the gut zoomer can provide insight into those causes of malabsorption. The digestive insufficiency and malabsorption panel is probably my favorite panel in the whole gut zoomer. And this is because most of the clients I see are stressed out, type A, anxious all the time. I regularly use this panel to show my patients how stress is preventing their digestive organs from producing adequate acid, enzymes, and bile. So it's not just what you eat, but what you absorb, assimilate, and do not eliminate. Without having robust enzymes, acid, or bile, you know, patients can suffer micronutrient deficiencies secondary to malabsorption of those nutrients. Acid, of course, is required for protein and B12 absorption. Bile is required for absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. If any markers are out of range on the markers of digestion and malabsorption panel, I often consider testing for low stomach acidity. Uh, this can actually help your patient find the appropriate dose of supplemental betaine HCL for them. It's also a great opportunity to dive into why the patient's not creating adequate digestive juices. You know, is it age? We make less acid after age 50. Is it a self H. pylori infection? Certainly that's gonna reduce the amount of acid in your gut. Or maybe is it stress? You know, nine times out of 10, I find it's really stress that's causing low stomach acidity. So what happens in the body when we're stressed? Well, think about being on a safari with a roofless Jeep and you have a bunch of lions charging at you, right? Likely your heart rate's gonna go up, your blood pressure's gonna go up, you know, blood flow's gonna be directed away from your digestive organs into your arms and legs so you can fight or flee. And this makes sense. Digesting your food is not a priority if you are about to be the food. You know, when this happens once or twice a month, no big deal. The digestive organs are like, hey, muscles, you can have the food. I'd like to survive, so you take all the energy, no big deal. But when that happens all day, every day, the digestive organs do suffer. They're malnourished. They're like, why are you starving me? can't do my job if you don't give me the energy I need. So certainly getting into a rest and digest state to allow that blood flow back to the gut, back to the stomach, to the intestines, to the to the pancreas to allow them to make these digestive juices is gonna help support digestion. So getting into that rest and digest state is the best way to support digestion. In fact, vagal nerve experts say we should be in rest and digest 80% of the time. Think about that, 80% of your day. <laughs> Good news, you can strengthen vagal tone and bring blood flow back to the digestive organs with deep diaphragmatic breathing, gargling, singing as well as humming. However, if your patients are not great at mind-body techniques, you can also take a supplement to support vagal activity. Found a great 2018 paper that provides evidence that, quote, the vagal nerve can be activated by non-pathogenic bacteria such as Lactobacillus lactis and Bifidobacterium. 
So I did a keyword search in my dispensary for lactobacillus lactis and bifidobacterium and ultimate flora extra care 50 billion by renew life was a top result. Now there are certainly many companies and many products that contain both probiotics. So going into your own dispensary and finding the best product for your clients is what I'd recommend doing here. So how else can we encourage our patients to switch into rest and digest before meals? Here are some ideas. One is taking five deep diaphragmatic breaths, really doing belly breathing, engaging the diaphragm to stimulate the vagus nerve. You can also try four, seven, eight breathing. So breathing in for the count of four, holding for a count of seven, and then breathing out for eight seconds. Actually having that exhale be twice as long as an inhale really does stimulate the vagus nerve and tell the body like everything's okay. You're not going to get eaten by a tiger um, because you can't exhale longer than your inhale when you're running, right? When you're, when you're wound up. The other thing is to sit down to eat. I know a lot of people who are eating while walking or multitasking, also turning off distractions is helpful, like the TV, setting down the phone, and then just be present with the food, you know, practicing gratitude, saying a prayer before a meal, and also breathing in the aromas of the food to generate saliva flow. I don't know about you, but my mouth always salivates when I smell fresh cookies out of the oven. So just smelling the food can actually get the flow of, of saliva going. Remember that up to 50% of your digestive juices are made during the cephalic phase of digestion. So before food even enters the mouth, once food is in the mouth, thoroughly chewing the food, noticing textures, flavors, and just eating a little bit slower. So putting the fork down in between bites, maybe trying chopsticks or eating with a non-dominant hand if you tend to be a fast eater. Also dining with others tends to make us slow down. We're having conversations. Someone asks you a question. You can't just keep eating because you probably don't want to answer with food in your mouth. And then making meals special, right? Making it a really a time to nourish your body. Um, you know, putting out placemats, lighting candles, playing music, anything that says to the body, like, this is time to nourish me, right? Taking that 30 minute lunch break and really making it for a time for you for nourishment. Another factor that prevents optimal micronutrient status is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Vibrant gut zoomer includes a commensal panel highlighting bacteria associated with SIBO. But first of all, what is SIBO? SIBO is a bunch of bacteria growing where they shouldn't be. While the large intestine is home to 10 billion to 10 trillion microbes, the small intestine should only have about a thousand, maybe hundred million bacteria. And that overgrowth blocks nutrient absorption. How does overgrowth block nutrient absorption? Well, think about the last time you were in a crowded room or a concert. The more people you have at a party, the harder it is to wade through all those people to get to the bar to buy a drink. Or for those public transportation commuters listening today, the more people you have waiting on the subway platform or bus stop, the longer it takes to get on that train or bus, right? In other words, SIBO by default contributes to malabsorption. And just look at all the nutrients absorbed in the small intestine. So if you suspect your patient has SIBO, resolving SIBO not only improves nutrient, re, uh, nutrient absorption, but also likely reduces the toxic burden by reducing levels of LPS bacteria, because certainly there's going to be LPS bacteria when you have overgrowth. So how do we resolve SIBO? There's a tendency to think of SIBO as an infection. After all, it is referring to bacterial overgrowth, right? Wrong. SIBO is not an infection like bronchitis or a UTI. Rather, it's a symptom of digestive dysfunction and a type of dysbiosis, simply too many good bacteria that seize the opportunity presented to them and ended up in the small intestine where they don't belong. Yes, antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials um, can help to treat and lower the number of bacteria in the small intestine, but that doesn't always solve the root cause. You know, when you throw bombs in the garden, it kills everything, and I find that the weeds tend to grow back first which is why nine times out of 10 patients relapse, get relapse SIBO, right? The SIBO relapses after the treatment. So what is the root cause here? Now, here is the paradigm shift I would love to share with you today. To solve opportunistic overgrowth, you must think about what is allowing these bacteria to grow. What opportunities are they taking advantage of? The pictures on the screen are from where I live in the high desert of central Idaho. 
we don't get much rain here. The picture on the left is the mountains, um, is what the mountains normally look like. And the picture on the right is from June. After a dry winter, we had the wettest, wettest spring I've ever experienced. And that spring, I saw more wildflowers and more types of wildflowers than I'd ever seen before. Wildflowers are opportunists. You know, they grow when the conditions are favorable. And the same is true for the opportunistic bacteria in your gut. Some providers think that SIBO is caused by colonic bacteria crawling back into, into the intestines through the ileocecal valve. Other providers believe that SIBO is initiated by an abundance of mouth bacteria that are not killed by your digestive juices. It's worth noting here that half the bacteria on the SIBO panel are actually mouth bacteria. Whenever I see elevated levels of streptococcus, micrococcus, acinetobacter, peptostreptococcus, or enterococcus on my patient's results, I ask them, do you brush your teeth in the morning? If so, before or after breakfast? Now, if your goal is to prevent dental caries, certainly brushing your teeth after meals is gonna remove acids and sugar and prevent those cavities from forming. However, if your goal is to reduce oral microbial load and reduce how many bacteria you're swallowing with breakfast, I recommend brushing before you eat, really as soon as you wake up in the morning. And think about it. Bacteria reproduce every 20 minutes. And if you sleep for eight hours, that's 24 generations. You know, at worst, we're talking exponential overgrowth. Um, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, right? They duplicate. <laughs> So while oral health is not the only cause of SIBO, I often find it's a contributing factor. In the case of SIBO, the body uses several natural mechanisms to prevent overgrowth. Number one, stomach acid. An acidic stomach or pH about 1.5 is a healthy stomach. Stomach acid drives digestion of food, which aids in absorption, and it also kills unwanted bacteria. When the stomach pH is too high, bacteria can survive the acid bath of the stomach and enter the small intestine. And number two, bile acids are the other natural mechanism that prevents overgrowth in the small bowel. Bile acids are naturally antimicrobial. So anytime a patient has sludgy or insufficient bile, that allows bacteria to thrive in the nutrient dense environment of the small intestine. Number three, pancreatic enzymes. When you optimally digest and absorb the nutrients you eat, it means there's very little leftover food to feed those opportunistic bacteria. Number four, migrating motor complex or MMC. And number five, motility and regular bowel movements. In other words, the biggest cause of SIBO is digestive dysfunction paired with slow motility. Before we dive into MMC motility, here's a couple of my favorite digestive support products. One is Digestimes by Designs for Health, which is a blend of HCL, oxbiolin enzymes, including specialized proteases to help break down gluteomorphin from gluten and casomorphin from casein. Digestion GB by Pure, Encap Pure Encapsulations is a mixture of enzymes, bile salts, taurine, and herbals to support healthy gallbladder function and lipid utilization. This is really my go-to for folks who don't have a gallbladder. I also frequently recommend clients start with individual products, so just HCL, just some enzymes, or just ox bile, and then titrate up to fig figure out what the right dose is for them. And then once we know the right dose, we can find a combination product that most meets their needs. You know, when giving supplemental enzymes and digestive support, clients ask, you know, do I have to take these forever? The answer, of course, is no. However, they can be helpful to use during times of stress, um, as well as when eating outside of your natural circadian rhythm. As a side note here, another way to support robust digestion is eating at the same time every day. Seriously, your body anticipates food. For example, if you usually eat at 8 a.m., but then one day, maybe Wednesday, wait till 10 a.m. to have breakfast, the body thinks, Hmm, the food didn't come at eight, it came at 10. Maybe tomorrow I'll be ready at nine. But then if you eat tomorrow, Thursday at, at, at 8 a.m. again, you know, you may eat, but your body may not be ready to digest the food you give it. Consider eating before um, an early morning flight. You know, you may have to eat breakfast at 5 a.m. so you don't starve for the whole day, but there's no way your body is ready to digest food at 5 a.m. because you're usually asleep, right? 
So most SIBO is a combination of digestive dysfunction combined with slow motility. So addressing the root cause of SIBO means understanding what's causing that slow motility of the small intestine in the first place. I like to think of the small intestine like a stream. You want clear moving water, really swift current. Anytime that current slows, it causes stagnation and the opportunity for growth where it shouldn't be. The most common cause of motility issues is dysfunction of the MMC, the migrating motor complex. Certainly enteric neuropathy or any adhesions from like a GI surgery that turn that graceful 70 mile an hour curve of the small intestine into a slow 90 degree turn can cause food to slow and not flow as quickly down the tube. Also constipation secondary to low fiber intake or pelvic floor issues can also cause things to back up and stop moving. But let's focus on the MMC today. The migrating motor complex is also known as the housekeeping wave of the stomach. It's similar to, but different than peristalsis, that wave-like action that pushes food down the digestive tract. In fact, peristalsis is what allows you to swallow food even if you're standing on your head. I like to think of peristalsis like waves on the shore of the beach, gently pushing food down the tube. In contrast, the MMC is like a huge tsunami wave, forcefully sweeping everything in the small bowel down to the colon for fermentation. Note here that the MMC happens only 90 minutes after the stomach completely empties. Therefore, if the patient has delayed gastric emptying or if they're grazing all day instead of eating spaced out meals, the MMC may not be happening. For this reason, experts recommend waiting four to five hours between meals to ensure gastric emptying and at least one cycle of MMC between meals. Also, fasting overnight can be helpful to promote the MMC. Here's a couple of nutraceuticals that support a robust MMC. One is MMC Restore by Gaia Herbs, which contains a combination of bitters, aromatics, antioxidants, choloretics, cholagogues, and prokinetic herbs traditionally used for atonic conditions of the GI tract. There's also Motility Activator by Integrative Therapeutics, Integrative therapeutics, which consists of a standardized extract of ginger and artichoke to support GI motility and transport. And as a side note, this patented combination has been the subject of two human randomized control trials. Also, when there's evidence of opportunistic overgrowth on the gut microbiome and SIBO panel, and the patient has a history of foodborne illness, consider ordering Vibrance Candida plus IBS Sure test to investigate if the migrating, um, if molecular mimicry is causing autoimmunity that's shutting off your patient's MMC. Note that this test used to be called IBS Sure, but is now a combination um, of fungal antibodies plus IBS Sure and has been renamed Candida plus IBS Profile. So to summarize, the best way to prevent opportunistic overgrowth is to strengthen vagal tone, promote robust digestion, support the migrating motor complex, and speed up motility. Most opportunistic overgrowth is a form of dysbiosis. Certainly, you can go down the rabbit hole looking at each individual bacteria on your patient's gut zoomer results, but I don't want to lose the forest for the trees. In general, if you feed it, it will grow and starve it and it will die. So the final thought I'd like to leave you with today is just simply supporting microbial diversity by eating a variety of plants and by limiting processed foods and added sugar, which generally drives dysbiosis. According to a 2018 American Gut Project paper, eating 30 types of plants per week is associated with greater microbial diversity than self-reported categories such as vegan or vegetarian. And Dr. Justin Sonnenberg's research published in 2001 in the prestigious journal of Cell showed surprisingly that fermented foods increase from, um, diversity more than plant intake alone. Finally, here are all the resources I mentioned today, the Environmental Toxins Guide, the Heavy Metals Guide, the Mycotoxins Guide, the Gut Zoomer Guide, as well as the Detoxification Support Nutraceutical Guide. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about vibrant testing, and I'm now happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, hello everyone. If you have any additional questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A and I will answer them as they arrive. Thanks so much for joining me today. And if you, have, if you have to leave, please do so now. Thanks for joining and the resources will be sent to you 
after this webinar ends, the recording, the slide deck, as well as all these handouts we talked about. All right. Um, Shauna, you can get the resource guides either by logging into your provider portal or they will be sent to all attendees at the end of this webinar. Um, Center for Stress Medicine, the number of plants per week that lead to the best microbial diversity per the recent research is 30, 30 plants per week. Um, when I learned this, I actually made a, um, a spreadsheet to track how many plants I was getting each week. And then uh, because my husband and I are both super competitive, we actually compete to see who can get the most plant points per week. Um, sort of fun. Um, how long do these treatments take to have a positive effect? Great question. Um, in terms of microbial diversity, the microbiome is very resilient. Um, you know, certainly there's short-term changes that can happen. For example, if you go on vacation to a tropical island, you're eating lots of mangoes and pineapples, those fructose-loving bacteria will just rrr, eat them and get really big. But then as soon as you go back to a normal diet, um, eating whatever it is, you probably won't be eating as much of the mangoes and pineapples, and then those bacteria levels will go back down. Um, it does take a sustained shift in your diet and lifestyle over time to see a shift in the microbiome. Um, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald on, I think it was the Huberman Lab podcast, said that she had a gentleman diagnosed with an autoimmune condition who was able to reverse it by eating 57 plants for breakfast every day as a smoothie. Um, they would go to the farmer's market, buy all the plants, make the smoothies, aliquot them into you know, a, a dose for each morning, and then have that every day. Certainly also like moving the high stress job, doing less travel, other things also impacted it, um, but it does require a, a sustained shift over time. Um, great question. Let me know if there's anything else I can answer about that. Um, question about pediatric patients. So the gut tumor has not been validated in a pediatric population, and there are definitely lots of changes that happen within the pediatric gut. Um, it's developing within the first two years, and then as we get into adulthood, it becomes more stabilized. However, you know, it is ordered by a lot of pediatric providers uh, who work with, you know, providers who work with the pediatric population. You just have to take that into consideration when um, interpreting the results. Uh, next question, would you recommend taking probiotics continuously? Ooh, so this is a tricky one. Um, I'm actually more of a fan of taking prebiotics than probiotics. I found that I find that probiotics is like um, a new kid at a school, right? Adding a new kid to a school. How much is that new kid really going to change the culture of that school? Instead, I like to feed my straight A students and then hopefully have such a great culture of doing really studious work and being a scholar athlete that we, you know, there's not even room for the um, the bad guys or opportunists to take over. Um, in terms of probiotics, it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, I attended the, uh, the Food Nutrition Conference and Expo last October, and I attended a session on probiotics. And really, you want to find the specific probiotic and the specific strain that matches the specific condition you're working to treat and how long they took it to see an effect. Um, certain probiotics, like the spore-based product probiotics, they can live, you know, like Bacillus subtilis can live for three weeks and then they leave your system. So honestly, taking it at like one week a month and then waiting for, you know, for three or four weeks before taking it again is a cost-effective way to still the, the impact of that probiotic. Um, great question. Um, do I have a plant guide? Um, anonymous attending, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I think just the more variety of plants you can eat, the better. Um, can we get your spreadsheet? Sure. <laughs> of course. I'm happy to share my plant tracking spreadsheet with you all. Um, uh, I will send that over to our marketing team to add it to the grouping of resources we're going to send you later. Um, the references for the two scientific papers um, are part of the, uh, the presentation. It's the last slide. It's at the bottom. Um, looks like we didn't share that on the video. So um, I will make sure we put that into the email that goes out as well. Um, they're also referenced on the Huberman Lab podcast where he interviews Justin Sonnenberg um, in his show notes. You can find it there as well. Um, let's see. Next question. 
um, three bowel movements per day. Yeah, we eat three times per day, right? So it makes sense that we would eliminate three times per day. You know, anywhere between one and three is considered healthy and normal for most people. Um, when you're detoxifying, though, most providers like to have more bowel movements as opposed to fewer bowel movements, um, just because the more you're getting things out of the body, the more you're getting toxins out of the body. Um, let me know if that doesn't make sense. Uh, all right, Sally, you want to know how molecular mimicry on the IBS test slows the MMC? Great question. So um, when you have a foodborne illness, um, your the, the bacteria will create cytolethal distending toxin B. Um, your body will then attack cytolethal distending toxin B, and you'll make antibodies against it. Um, however, the antibodies to cytolethal distending toxin B have molecular mimicry with the protein vinculin. Um, vinculin is a protein within the human body, naturally present, that, that, um, uh, that moderates the interstitial cells of Kajal. And the interstitial cells of Kajal starts that migrating motor complex. So when your body is attacking vinculin, it shuts down the migrating motor complex. Um, certainly we can talk a lot more about the details of all of that, uh, but hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and let me know if it doesn't. Next question. Uh, someone's suggesting, um, they use a veggie mash recipe with their clients to get a wider variety of vegetables and you can find. Oh, sorry. So sorry. Excited hands just, uh just through the microphone off of the table. Um, you can find recipes from Google or YouTube. Yeah, I mean, parents use this all the time, right? Pureeing vegetables, putting it into the pasta sauce. Kids don't even know they're getting 10 different types of vegetables. Um, let's see. Have you seen postbiotics helping shifting the results? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to optimize postbiotics, especially short chain fatty acids. Um, short chain fatty acids uh, help to maintain the one layer of cells. They help renew um, the cells within the intestinal microbiome, um, help keep that mucus layer, help balance the microbiome. There's even now studies showing that uh, people have better COVID outcomes when they have better short chain fatty acid levels. So absolutely optimizing, optimizing short chain fatty acids and other postbiotics. Um, next question with a patient experiencing dehydration and repetitive electrolyte imbalance, how would you help support the colon and associated functions? Ooh, dehydration and repetitive electrolyte imbalance. Well, I would be wondering about the root cause of that dehydration and repetitive electrolyte imbalance. Um, is it an intake issue? Is it an absorption issue? Um, is it an oral intake issue? Um, what else is going on? I would identify the root cause and, um, and, and work to fix that probably. Um, also probably, well, yeah, I would start there. I would, I would look at root cause, what's causing the dehydration and repetitive electrolyte imbalance. Um, and probably work on that before detoxing. Um, actually, before doing any detox, I like to make sure my patient can handle it. Um, you know, when we do provoke, we are pulling toxins out of the fat tissues. Um, you can think of toxins sort of like criminals. And if the body has too much toxic burden, then um, sometimes the body, instead of, you know, being able to process normally through the liver, starts to put those criminals in your fat cells. It's like putting criminals in jail. And although that's not awesome, it's not ideal, it does help prevent the total body burden because criminals in jail can't break into stores and steal things or you know, damage property. Um, however, once you start to mobilize toxins, it lets the criminals get out of the jail cells. Now they're running around your body, they're stealing cars, they're smashing banks, like whatever. Um, and people who are experiencing dehydration and repetitive electrolyte imbalance probably aren't able to, to deal with that mobilization. So I would really ad address the thing that's going to be most helpful first. Um, all right, I see someone raise their hand. If I can find that question, here we go. 
thoughts on patients who cycle through diarrhea, constipation, still void every day, and what microbes on the gut zoomer should be considered. Ooh, yeah, diarrhea, constipation, IBS mixed, right? So once you have um, IBS mixed, um, it can be, the first thing I would think of is, um, depending on what type of diarrhea it is. If it's like watery diarrhea, first of all, it could be due to just constipation. Um, if you have a solid column of stool, the only thing that can get around it is liquid. So some people actually are constipated and have diarrhea and then you know eliminate that huge column of stool. Um, if it's a looser stool with some constipation, um, then I might look into like a food sensitivity issue. Um, per the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano, zonulin opens up the tight junctions. This happens also with foodborne illness and diarrheal diseases. Essentially, when you open up the tight junctions, it allows liquid from inside the body to get into the gut lumen, which then flushes out the bacteria. Can happen to a large degree, right? If a foodborne illness, you have explosive diarrhea, but on a shorter or a smaller scale with food sensitivities, it can cause that same mechanism um, opening the gut lumen water getting in, liquid getting in, and then getting some diarrhea. Um, so if that is the case, I would wonder not so much maybe about microbes, but looking at intestinal permeability markers and that cell membrane integrity. Ooh, no, bacteria. Yes, acromancy mucinophila, which was crucial to that mucus layer. I would look at that and then seeing if there's overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria. With LPS, it's breaking down that mucus layer. So those three things, um, intestinal hyperpermeability with zonulin, antigliadin, um, looking at acromancy and the mucus layer, and then looking at LPS bacteria also breaking down that barrier. Um, okay, let's see. Next question. Terry wants to know what prebiotics I recommend. Um, resistant starch for sure. So green bananas cooked in cold rice, legumes, and potatoes doesn't have to be cold when you eat it, it can just be left over. So cook it Monday, eat it Tuesday, um, along with, uh, you know, um, also polyphenols are great prebiotics. Let's see. So I think that coffee and tea with milk counts as a disruptive to the MMC and the gap between meals. I've been told that anything that has a nutritive value, Jessica, counts as an MS, MMC disruptor. Um, listening to the Huberman Lab podcast where he interviews Dr. Sachin Panda, they talk about this. And basically anything with, with nutrition, anything with calories is can throw off the MMC. Certainly just drinking water, probably not. Um, and it really gets into the like, the gray area. So I highly recommend, um, highly recommend listening to that, that podcast. If you want more details from the experts, right. Who, who do this every day, all day. Um, let's see. Next question. Um, Rosemary wants to know if I can send a list of supplements I recommend. Um, the list of supplements is really different for every patient. I personalize it for them. Um, I think top ones would be like Paleo Fiber RS, which has a great blend of uh, resistant starches. Um, the Digest Zymes product I use with a lot of patients. Um, the polyphenol booster by Pendulum really feeds acromancia if we need to do that. Um, GI Revive is a great one by Designs for Health, I believe, to help you know heal the gut microbiome. Um, sure, intermittent fasting, absolutely, Rosemary. Um, for folks who want to build acromancia, intermittent fasting has been shown to help increase that one um, and also help sort of rest the gut, especially like just 12 hours between dinner and breakfast is great. Um, Mary would like us to consider doing a webinar about the MNC and thank you, Lynn. Um, absolutely. We would love to offer that in the future. Thanks for that suggestion. Um, Amal wants to know if I, if I, if I have an antimicrobial protocol of berberine before a gut restore protocol um, to remove a pathogen infection from stool test. Oh, great question. So if someone has a pathogen, something like entamoeba histolytica, because there is extra hepatic issues, like it can go to your brain, it can go to your liver. Like I would definitely treat that. Um, 
However, if it's just opportunistic overgrowth, I find that just rebalancing the microbiome sometimes works better than a kill protocol um, for most of my clients, not all. But that's because um, if you think of the microbiome like a garden, um, you know, there's there's vegetables and then there's like weeds. And if you throw bombs in the garden, it kills everything and the weeds tend to grow back first. And sometimes slow is actually fast. So just feeding the commensals, supporting digestion, supporting motility helps the garden find a nice balance without killing things. Like the things that are optimistically overgrowing eventually will stop being able to overgrow because the conditions don't allow them to do that. Um, I don't have a particular antimicrobial protocol. Again, that depends on the pathogen present. Is it a bacteria? Is it protozoa? Is it a helminth? Like they all have different um, different treatment plans, and some require you know an antibiotic or an antifungal or something like this. If someone has MCAS or mold toxicity and hypersensitivity to supplements, would you consider um, what would you recommend for supporting the liver? Ooh. Um, Great question. So if they have hypersensitivity to supplements, I'd like to know more about what specifically they're sensitive to. Um, and if no supplements are tolerated for whatever reason, just working on food, eating more broccoli, food, you know, um, cabbage family foods, it helps support the liver. Um, for example, staying hydrated, um, eating adequate protein. I mean, there's lots of ways to go about it, Elena. Um, Mary wants to know what podcast I mentioned. They're all actually listed as resources in the slide deck that will be sent to you. So if you can remember the slide where I talked about it, all the art, um, the podcast notes should be there or the podcast links, excuse me. Um, Cindy's suggesting using coffee as a bitter to help with motility. Certainly that speeds up most people in the morning. Um, how do I feel? Angeline wants to know how I feel about long-term use of berberine. Um, potentially affecting the microbiome. So berberine is one of those unique antimicrobial compounds that actually supports acromantia because berberine stimulates your goblet cells to create more mucin um, for the acromantia to consume. So if you have opportunistic overgrowth and you also have low acromantia, doing berberine could potentially help both at the same time. Um, maybe not doing a full on kill protocol, but just adding a little bit of berberine to support acromantia and that mucin production while slightly reducing overgrowth. Um, do you recommend testing pregnant patients or postpartum patients? Um, Love you. Um, great question. So, because the microbiome changes so much during pregnancy, uh, it's not going to reflect what is normally present for that person, right? Our microbiomes change, especially the vaginal microbiome in preparation for birth. We want to give our children um, as many probiotics, as many commensal bacteria as possible. So everything shifts during pregnancy to support that. So it's if you're looking at, you know, what's happening right now in the pregnant person, sure. But if you're looking to help mom, you know, waiting till after, after pregnancy. Um, we actually have an FAQ on this, um, which you can email clinical at vibrant-america.com and we can send you that FAQ or you can just look online and find the FAQs and search for postpartum um, and find it there. Let's see what things I have missed. That. 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 All right, we are at the top of the hour. I'm going to stick around and look through every FA or every Q and A that was submitted, and and hopefully answer anything that I missed. Um, thanks so much for sticking around. Um, but if you have to go, um, have a good rest of your Tuesday. Um, yes, I do have references for the 30 veggies per day and diversity study. 
Um, they are both mentioned in the Huberman Lab podcast where he interviews Dr. Justin Sonnenberg. And we'll make sure to send those out um, with the resources at the end of the webinar. Um, Heidi wants to know if you'd ever do a combination of pre and probiotics. Absolutely. Yeah. If your acromancia is at 0.1 on the gut zoomer, I would support it with both acromancia from pendulum as well as a polyphenol booster or some other red polyphenol blend as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can always do that if you really want to support um, a bacteria. And are the gut microbiome and SIBO markers part of the gut zoomer? Yes, they are. The SIBO panel is one of the commence, one of the 11 commensal panels. So it is included in the gut zoomer and even just the gut commensal panel. As a favorite way or product to measure motility time, Dave. Um, good question. I think this is going to correlate with constipation. Um, I am not a doctor, so I can't do those like capsule swallow, see how long it takes to come out studies. Um, and I haven't taken a deep dive into the literature to see what's even available for measuring motility, but just looking at constipation markers, overgrowth markers would be the way I'd gain insight on that as a dietitian. Um, James wants to know if I recommend any products from CellCore or Systemic Formulas. Sure, absolutely. Lots of great products by both companies. That's that one. What considerations? What considerations do you take when a Zoomer was done on a six-year-old, specifically with H. pylori overgrowth, elevated anticleidin, yet celiac panel was negative? All right, Lindsay, here is the answer to that. Um, if a gut Zoomer shows H. pylori overgrowth and elevated anticleidin, yet the celiac panel is negative, it would indicate that they likely have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Certainly celiac disease is one way that gluten can impact the human body, but there's also non-autoimmune ways for gluten to cause problems within the body. Um, and if you want more question or more uh, information on that, I recommend scheduling a, a clinical consult, a consult with a member of a clinical education team um, to go into the differences between gut zoomer and wheat zoomer, um, especially exploring the wheat zoomer. Um, there's lots of great insights there. Oh, Angeline is coming back to the berberine um, supplementation. Could it create dysbiosis? Sure. I mean, anything you do could create dysbiosis. Um, if you take too much of it, I mean, the dose makes the poison. So if you took like copious amounts of berberine, sure. Just like I had a friend who took too much, too many iodine tablets while, while backpacking and then they killed all the microbes in their gut and then they ended up with a C. diff infection because they just had no commensals left. Um, so I think you would need to be uh, you know, careful on your dosing and careful on watching symptoms to see what's happening. Um, great question. Um, Labib is asking about supplements I recommend for pregnant or breastfeeding women. I don't work with that population at this time, um, so I don't have any recommendations for that population. What is my supplement herb? Um, Cherith wants to know what's my go-to supplement herb for supporting normal GI function in mold cases. Also curious if I have any recommendation on a particular coffee that is low histamine or mold-free. Several patients reporting having difficulty while consuming coffee in recent years. Um, ooh, okay, so let's, let's answer the coffee one first. Um, certainly there are certified mold-free coffees out there. Um, I think Purity Coffee is one of them. There's I'm, I'm certainly more than one brand out there. That's the one that comes to mind. Um, they did have a booth at the Food Nutrition Conference and Expo, so that one comes to mind first. Um, 
Also, if you do a dark roast versus a light roast, they can have, you know, more or less acid in them, and that can be more irritating for some folks as opposed to others. Um, and also with mold cases, if you're getting mycotoxins through the food you're eating, taking binders um, with the food um, to help bind the mycotoxins so they don't get absorbed into the hepatic portal vein would be an option. Um, we do a mycotoxin specific binding agents handout where you can see which particular binders help bind specific mycotoxins. So if you do Vibrant's mycotoxins test and you know exactly which mycotoxins are showing up for your patient, you can identify which binders to use to help prevent absorption um, from the gut into the body of those or to help get them out of the body if they're already in the body. Um, Angeline's circling back to the berberine question. Um, the question was if long-term use of berberine for say lipids could create dysbiosis. This is tapping into my knowledge of berberine. Um, from what I understand, doesn't berberine impact blood sugar? Like it can be used for both blood sugar regulation, which is why it's currently out of stock for many labs because someone in social media was like, berberine is the same as, as a zempic. Um, I didn't know it worked for lipids, so I would have to dive into the literature to see um, how berberine impacts lipids to create dysbiosis. Um, Rosemary, the list of supplements I recommended during this webinar is included on the PowerPoint slide deck. So just go through that slide deck to see all the supplements I listed there. Dave wants to know why do they call them Zoomers? <laughs> Love this question. So with Zoomers, we're looking at the peptides, not the proteins. So if you think about a protein, three-dimensional structure, let's say it's made of a strand of pearls that's been bound into a three-dimensional structure, right? It's like a ball of pearls. Now, um, that would be our food sensitivity test. Now, if you unwind that strand of pearls and you cleave that strand of pearls into small fragments, those are peptides. We've literally zoomed into the protein and now we're looking at individual peptide fragments. So not just wheat, but we're looking at gliadin, we're looking at glutenin, we're looking at serpents, we're looking at pharynins, we're looking at the little tiny pieces of that broken down protein. So we're zooming in to look even closer at any type of antibody reactivity to fragments of that whole protein. Great question, Dave. Um, other folks are listing Purity and Life Boost Coffee as um, mold-free coffees. Um, Amal is saying, not a question, but a life boost coffee is tested and experimented leaving used grounds at room temperature compared to other used grounds, no mold. Okay. Um, yeah, coffee tends to be a very moldy product just because the folks who grow coffee tend to not have very much, you know, they're lower on the economic scale and they are paid by the weight of the coffee they sell. So, you know, some will wet down the coffee before selling it and then it is shipped wet. And anytime you have greater than 60% humidity, that encourages mold growth. And anytime you have mold growth, um, you can get mycotoxins created as well. Kara wants to know in the Q ratio section on the test, what does F to B and P to B stand for? Um, that's explained on the first page where there's a red line around it. F to B stands for Hermicutes to Bacteroidetes. These are two phyla um, of bacteria. And then P to B stands for Prevotella to Bacteroides. Those are both within the Bacteroidetes phyla, but they're, I think it's classes of microbes. And if you want more information on that, please um, consider scheduling a clinical consult as well. Um, all right, someone else sent me a PubMed article. 
probably not going to read that whole article during this webinar, Dave, um, but I will open it up in a separate window so I can read it later. Um, and then if I get a chance to add something to the marketing email that we send out, I'll include it there. Sarah is looking for the slide deck, but don't see it attached to the invite. Sarah, we're going to send out everything at the end of this webinar. You'll receive a follow-up email saying, thanks for attending. Here's the recording. Here's the slide deck. And here's all the resources we talked about. You are so welcome. All right. Final questions are all related to berberine. So if you all want to stick around, I can quickly look at this article and answer it here. Um, the article is, can berberine live up to the claim that it's nature's ozempic? Oh, goodness. Oh, yes, 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 this one. So just skimming it, it's looking like it's sh sharing that we need more data, which is a pretty standard answer for, you know, is there enough evidence on this? Um, not yet. We need more. We need more research to be done on it. Um, certainly, if you use um, if you use this product on your patients for whatever you use it for, either um, you know microbial overgrowth or blood sugar um, support, and it works, and you've seen it work, like your clinical expertise and experience has, um, you know, still has validity, right? Um, certainly, we like scientific literature, and we like, you know, um, randomized controlled trials, and we like lots of review articles, and we like to see what has been done in a scientific setting. But what you do in your clinical practice also has validity. So I would say whatever works for you and your patients works for you and your patients. And if it works, it works. All right, I think that is all of the questions. If you have any additional questions, feel free to send them through the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm gonna hang out here. for a moment longer. You are so welcome. Thanks for joining. Thanks for all your great questions. This is the best part is answering the questions live, even when I accidentally knock my microphone on the ground. Glad to hear you love the talk, Angeline. Thanks for joining. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in. So thanks so much for joining everyone. It's a pleasure speaking with you today, answering your questions. And again, we will send out those resources um, after this webinar ends. Take care, everyone.